You've reached Hotel Pacifico, your five-star destination for BC Politicos. Press 4 for room service. Press the star key for your hosts, Mike McDonald and Kate Hammer. Welcome, hotel visitors. And for those who are frequent guests, I'm happy to announce Pacifico Points, our new affinity program. The more you listen, the smarter you get. <laughs> Jeff, where did Kate go? We lost I don't Kate. know. We're we're missing Kate, but I I you tell me, and I'm glad to know she's going to arrive soon. She's just held up unavoidably and will join us in time. Well, for I the think uh, she might be out uh, landscaping in the labyrinth-like uh, maze in front of the Hotel Pacifico. She has a bit of a green thumb, so maybe she's just trying to keep the grounds looking good for us. But thanks for jumping in and co-hosting the interview today. My pleasure. Hard to fill her shoes, but I'll try. Or hard to fill our heels, as one might <laughs> might think. Uh, you know, since um, our last episode, we had uh, a nice little plug from Bob Cronbauer, the uh, founder and editor of Vancouver is Awesome. Bob binge listened the early episodes of Hotel Pacifico, and he came out the other side uh, reasonably stable and in mentally good shape. And... Uh, <laughs> released an Instagram reel uh, yesterday. So uh, go check it out if you haven't seen it. Thanks, Bob. And your German is excellent. In fact, I think Bob may know more German than John Horgan. <laughs> that would be uh, easy. Yeah, that would be, be easy. But yeah, easy. it was great. And and it's always nice to have applause from Bob and really miserable if he doesn't like you, you can tell right away. So thanks, Bob. Yeah, when Bob's not happy about something, it's uh, I understand it can be an unpleasant experience. <laughs> But I've never had that. Like Bob's always happy with me, probably because yeah. no, I'm buying well, him a beer. I've, I've I've seen him deal with some other people, and uh, yeah, he suffers uh, fools poorly. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> hey, we'll leave it at that. Um, hey, we've got a great guest here today. Um, Jess Ketchum's joining us at the Hotel Pacifico. He has spent decades in the BC political jungle. He's campaigned on the rolling hills of the Caribou. He's had a regular microphone on the Bill Good Show for many years. He's navigated the back rooms of BC's free enterprise, two of BC's free enterprise, free enterprise political parties, and four of premiers across those two parties. And he's an all-around good guy. Welcome to the Hotel Pacifico, Jess Ketchum. Yeah, hey, Mike, very, little, very little has happened during that period that Jess didn't know something about, so I'm really looking forward to this. Or didn't cause, Jeff. <laughs> um so so thanks very much guys for uh for inviting me to uh stay at the uh hotel pacifico i have to tell you that um i didn't have to binge listen i actually um uh tuned in uh on a regular basis and listened to them all and and really enjoy them congratulations but the only reason i really came on today was to uh to meet kate and uh i'm a little disappointed that's you old war yeah. horses that I have to deal with. I know. Yeah, fair enough. I know she uh, she definitely uh, brings a little more vitality to the show than us two old fossils here. And three old fossils in this case today. <laughs> now, I have a uh, scientific question for you to start, Jess. And um, for some of our listeners who may be younger than Generation X, can you explain and take a moment to think about it? Can you explain to them? What is a Socred? Uh, yes, I can. A Socred is a non ndp -er. <laughs> So <laughs> <laughs> we define it by what it's not. <laughs> to expand to expand on that uh, explanation, um, uh, when I first got into politics, it was uh, really. Um, uh, um it was about it was about the economy it was about um you know uh, what what was really important to british columbia's economic future and the ndp um at that time didn't have uh the message that that the socred party had as we know the socred party historically came out of alberta Aberhart, and prior to that it was a, um, a british economist that um uh, had these um, uh, theories that I could never figure out. Funny money. Yeah, funny money. That's what how everybody explains it. But I was never able to uh, figure that out. Nobody could ever explain that to me. And so it was really about 
um, free enter free enterprise versus the other guys, and and uh, it's a little more disjointed now today, but nevertheless, mm -hmm. um, back then it certainly was. In fact, the first campaign that I ever got involved in, I, I was still in high school, nineteen. I, I shouldn't do this, but nineteen sixty six, and uh, I was in high school. There was a by election in the Caribou. Uh, <clears throat> Um, Robert Bonner, who had been a cabinet minister in W.A.C. Bennett's government, um, needed a seat, and and Bennett wanted him badly in cabinet, and so he um, ran him in the Caribou. Um, a guy that I had met, um, uh, who was very very involved with the um, um, UBC liberals, uh, um, young liberals. Uh, by the name of David Zernhelt. David Zernhelt. David Zernhelt, a dedicated young liberal um, wow. who had been a star in um, in um, uh, Justin Trudeau's father's government. He had been yeah. he worked in Ottawa in Pierre's yeah. office. Uh, <clears throat> he came back in UBC. He was he was a star with young liberals. He came to work on that campaign and and recruited me because I had been involved in some, you know, minor uh, school politics, as we all have done. And um, he recruited me to be involved in the liberal campaign, which pleased my mother to no end, who was a diehard liberal. However, um, being uh, young and, um, and um, obstinate, I had a falling out with Mr. Jernhelt early in that campaign. <clears throat> As Jeff, you've probably had those as well with David. Anyway, I had a falling out with uh, with uh, Zernhelt. I walked down the street and into um, uh, Bob Bonner's campaign office. The campaign manager for Bonner was a guy that I knew. And of course, they signed me up right away. And um, the rest was history. And so I take great pride in the first campaign that I ever worked on we actually elected in the Caribou a guy that wore a plastic cover over his cowboy hat. Um, that was <laughs> real claim to fame. That's when you could elect an urban person in rural BC and get away with it. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. So, so Bonner was our MLA for a period. A guy by the name of Alex Fraser, of course, was the was the mayor. He had been he of uh, Alex Fraser Bridge fame. Uh, yes, and um, uh, yeah, uh, certainly, and. Um, uh, to me, very famous for being one of the best uh, riding MLAs that ever ever served uh, British Columbians. He really was truly that. He was the uh, commissioner of Cornell before it was a village. He became the reeve of Cornell and then the mayor of Cornell, which he was for 20 years. And then he was the MLA for 20 years and um, sort of died with his boots on. And um, by the way, from throat cancer, which... Uh, um, I've had an issue with, and like John Horgan, um, and uh, we've all been down that path. Anyway, that was um, my initiation into uh, politics, and then I, Alex, uh, liked the way I worked on the Bonner campaign, I guess, or it was just another free volunteer, and um, uh, signed me up to uh, work with him, which I did, of course, for years, uh, ran his campaigns in the Caribou Um for a number of number, and he of scooped people. you up and brought you to Victoria to to work with him when he was minister. Yeah, he um, uh, um, at one point in my life, I was the um, um, the executive director of the Caribou Tourist Association, which was one of nine tourism regions in the province. And our job was to go out and sell um, BC to the world. And my area was the uh, the Caribou and the the writing. Um, uh, boundaries were virtually the same as the uh, riding of Caribou, um, which was a massive riding. I mean, huge. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> I loved that whole area. I spent so much time, um, as you know, Mike, uh, uh, back roads and four wheel drives and visiting ranchers and doing all those things. I did that, loved it. And, uh, but I got to know everybody. And in that job, I knew every councillor, every chamber of commerce, every, you know, got to know the writing exceptionally well. And Alex used that for years because he'd, he'd phone and ask me questions about 
what was going on in certain areas and certain issues. And yeah. I was able to provide him with that sort of background. Then finally, he decided that he needed to have me in Victoria for some reason. So he offered me uh, the job in Victoria. I moved to Victoria, newly married, 1978, and um, was his, um, I guess now you'd call him chief of staff. I was a senior uh, political appointment in his uh, in his office and a pretty dynamic time in BC history then as well mm -hmm. with Premier Bennett um, as uh, Bill Bennett as the, um, the premier, of course. Right. And then um, you got to uh, 1989 when I believe it was 1989 when Alex Fraser passed away, yeah. as you said, with his boots on um, and there was a by-election in the Caribou. And uh, I bring that up uh, partly because you you mentioned David Zernhelt. He reemerges in 1989 as an NDP candidate, in some ways representing uh, Mike Harcourt, stretching the NDP coalition to include more liberals, but also he's a very electable guy. Um, and he had chosen a side as opposed to being a liberal. He had chosen his side to go NDP. And that by-election, which uh, the Socrates lost, um, was probably a pretty influential event in the breakup of the social credit dynasty. You know, it was kind of a, one of the dominoes that fell along the ways leading to a um, cataclysmic event in 1991. So I'm interested in your uh, observations about, um, you saw it firsthand as the social credit party um, kind of um, went into the ground. And then um, you, what were you thinking during that time? How it, what, what were you observing as the it seemed to be this uh, successive decline of this once great party that had been in power for most of uh, four decades? Well, you know, I think you could even draw that path, Mike, where uh, Alex Fraser's demise, his his passing, um, was really where that started because Alex was a big part of the glue that held the party together in rural. BC especially. Um, I mean, he was um, he was so uh, so admired by the party stalwarts, if you will, throughout the province in rural BC. That with him gone, that was a big hole. And, and Zernhelt's rise, um, you have to you have to appreciate that um, David was from a um, you know, long, well thought of, long standing, well thought of family from the Caribou ranching family. And uh, so the transition to a, a David Zernhelt um, NDP member was not a real stretch because it was, he was, a, as someone said, he was a good old boy. And that was when he was very young. <laughs> so um, he, was, um, he was the right candidate for the NDP at the time. Um, but um, the story that you, you maybe don't know, Mike, is that um, Bill Bennett had planned on dueling the caribou seat because it was so big to have two MLAs rather than one. And he asked me if I would run. And I, um, uh, after much, uh, <laughs> much thought and uh, debate with my wife, um, I told him that I would, and then they didn't do that. And that's when I decided to leave uh, Victoria because I, I decided that I, I didn't want to be a lifelong staffer or a civil servant, although I had, I had learned, like all of us, the um, the value of really good civil servants, and there's lots of them, by the way. Um, and um, uh, I decided that I was leaving. That's when I, I left Victoria and, and went to work for Jimmy at Expo. So then it was a matter of I was uh, I was free to think uh, the way I wanted when it came to politics, and. Um, then with the with the advent of Bill Van der Zam taking over the Social Credit Party, um, that's kind of where it left me. Uh, mm -hmm. I was uh, very much uh, uh, a part of the the leadership campaign of Bud Smith in uh, in Whistler, and uh, when um, uh, Van der Zam got the uh, the job, it was really tough on a whole bunch of people who had been. Uh, Bennett people prior to that. And we know how these things play out yeah. uh, with uh, political staffers. But uh, so I was on the outside for a period of time there, which was fine. I did not mind that at all. I was building my own business. And um, uh, the timing worked out well until our 
mutual friend Jerry Lampert, when he was uh, brought back to BC to be a, um, a senior guy with uh, Van Der Zem, uh, talked to myself and a couple of others, uh, names you would be familiar with, Pat Kinsella and, uh, yeah. and David McPhee, um, and asked us to be, come back involved. Um, and we all made a mistake and said yes. Um, <laughs> and um, the rest is really history. So yeah. it was... just just stop there for a second, yeah. Jess, because it, I look at you know the the monolithic uh, period of social credit leadership first with W. A. C. Bennett and then his son Bill Bennett, and from an outsider standpoint, from the uh, NDP side, this seemed like this was eternity and was never going to change. And then in a matter of years, social credit's gone. And is the political lesson that it's not so much the brand as what you're selling? Um, you said it, it's basically non-NDP. Uh, was it easy to switch from social credit to some other vehicle simply because the content was the critical factor? I've always been curious about that. And it's yeah. today as Gordon, as uh, Kevin Falcon seeks to rebrand. Right. Well, you know, I, I uh, the social credit brand was very, very important for a period of time in BC pol politics, and um, uh, but its use became diluted um, tremendously, and and the transition from from the Socreds to the Liberals um, was was smoother than than you might think. I mean, when you when you think about um, uh, the number of people that stuck with the social credit brand and went down fighting, there weren't very many because everybody was more focused on what what vehicle was required to deliver the the policies that people felt were necessary. I, I go back to the you know we all we all talk um, about James Carvel and it's it's the economy, stupid. Well. It's the economy, stupid. And back in those days, it was very much a focus. And so you, you had, um, you know, the the reform blip um, with um, uh, Jack Weisgerber and Martin Brown screwing up Gordon Campbell's campaign of '96. Um, and um, you know, you could you could see where in three or four ridings, twelve hundred votes would have changed the the course of history on that one. Yeah, and. Uh, <clears throat> pretty pretty interesting stuff but but then when when um, uh gordon campbell became involved running the party um the thing that was really interesting to me jeff back to your question was that that people didn't know whether he was a so was a socred a liberal or a conservative and i can remember um having people phoning me from around the province old socred uh uh, campaigners saying, what's this guy Campbell all about? And um, I'd say, well, you know, you have to make up your own mind. Uh, I'll arrange for you to meet him. And I had guys flying down from northern BC. I mean, solid, solid, hardcore Socreds coming down to meet Gordon and um, having a meeting with him and walking away going, hey, that guy's great. He's a real Socred. Well, actually... <laughs> just, paint quick, just paint a picture. How does... How do you name, name some names that are familiar to me and, and maybe not to others, but was there a meeting call? Did a bunch of people get together and say, hey, we got to get this guy Campbell going? Or, you know, was there a, a couple of lunches at the Vancouver Club or, you know, a, a meeting called in somebody's living room to say, we just can't take this Harcourt situation with the NDP. We've got to make some moves here. How did the how did the train get moving? Well, I think Jeff, you've been involved in some of those trains. I mean, uh, I, I think they're very similar party to party, and um, there were multiple gatherings because there are numerous people uh, involved in the political process in BC who believe they are are influencers, who believe they are um, um, well, rightly or wrongly. <laughs> believe they run the show, <laughs> yeah. and we all know them. Uh, but you know the the fact of the matter is there are a lot of those meetings and a lot of those rooms. And um, uh, Campbell was um, was very good himself at uh, uh, positioning uh, himself in the right way with the party. And uh, 
with the stalwarts around the province and uh, and you know again it was uh, um he wasn't he wasn't the ndp yeah and, and and jeff and i were having this little debate yesterday about what what really happened in the 1990s and uh i was trying to explain to jeff that i felt it was a little more organic as opposed to maybe the um leftist conspiracy theory uh that uh it was just a all hatched up in the back room but uh what was true is that the liberals had a breakthrough in 91 and they had a brand that had some elasticity to it meaning they could grow from the center um maybe poach some NDP votes, but certainly had to, there was a lot of uh, vacuum on the right. And Campbell had no previous affiliations from a partisan basis, and he had some elasticity to himself in terms of his uh, what he could uh, pull into that. And, uh, you know, over time, guys like you, and, and Jeff, when did, how long did it take you to come over to the BC Liberals anyways? Like, because, you, you know, you've been a soak right up through the 91 election. Did it, was it hard for you to swallow to come to change sides or... Did you just say, oh, that's obvious. we got to go with these guys now. Well, Mike, as you know, I'm a pretty uh, committed guy when it comes to what party I uh, I support. Mm -hmm. um, was it was it difficult? No, because I, I saw the writing on the wall. I thought that it was a reality. And to me, it wasn't so much the the brand. And maybe this is where the advantage is of not having been in the Liberal Party or the NDP Party, both with, you know, real histories of of um, campaigns and 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 you know lots of good work the fact of the matter is the socrates didn't didn't have a lot of that so you could sort of jettison the label if you saw where there was an opportunity to further the the policy regime that you felt was right and mm -hmm. so so it was not a difficult thing for me to move to the liberals once Gordon Campbell was there. Right. I couldn't do it with Gordon Wilson, but once Gordon Campbell was there, um, I could because it that opened the door. Yeah. That opened the door for me and, and, and a whole lot of others as well. I mean, uh, um, he brought a lot of people together like uh, Gordon Wilson could not do. I mean, when he, when he ran for the uh, uh, leadership, I always, you know, it's very interesting. The three Gordons, um, Gordon Wilson, Gordon Gibson, and Gordon Campbell, um, uh, pretty, pretty interesting group of people. And um, uh, there was a lot of momentum uh, behind Gordon Campbell once he got going. But, yeah. you know, Mike, you talk about, about um, uh, the uh, advent of the BC Liberal Party under Wilson, and too much credit is given to that one quote during that one debate. Um, I know that you did a lot of work in the background mm -hmm. <laughs> in developing that party and recruiting good candidates and all those things. Mm -hmm. But um, um, it seems to me it always has been that there's been too much attention paid to that one one quote of Gordon's. In that it, it's definitely a story for another day in terms of some of the uh, key personalities behind yeah. that BC Liberal campaign. Uh, not to mention Christy Clark, for sure, right. who was a big part of that. Um, but let's, so fast forwarding to the future, or to the present and the future, um, 96, 2001, 2005, 2009, 2013, 2017, the BC Liberal Party won six popular vote margins in a row. Yeah. And four mandates out of those six. Yeah. Two, they won the popular vote and didn't win. Yes. Well, one of them, they technically won the election, but we know what happened. And the other one, Glenn Clark, won an outright majority, even though he lost a popular vote by three points. They won so, the election, Mike. They won the election. They just didn't win the government. Yes. Yes. <laughs> too soon. Hashtag too soon. But um, <laughs> but the point is that BC Liberal brand is one of the most successful electoral brands in history of British Columbia, history in Canadian politics, almost to do six in a row winning the popular vote. So... Like that was a winning formula. What what do you think? I mean, leadership's part of it, sure, but what do you think were the key ingredients behind that success for six uh, elections that managed to bring together over forty percent of the vote every time? Well, I think I, you know some pretty extraordinary leadership. We have to admit. I mean, yeah. uh, I think that's the case, and. Um, uh, you and I were both you much more than me uh, involved in Christie's uh, 
surprise win, surprise to a whole bunch of people but us. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, when she pulled the pulled it out of the hat, seventeen, right? Was that seventeen? Thirteen. Yeah. Thirteen. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, so, you know, leadership counts uh, a lot, and um, uh, so. But I there was uniting. There, there was yeah, uniting forces as well, right? From yeah, policy. Yeah, for sure. And uh, so um, I think that uh, those policies with strong leadership um, within the party um, held it together. And uh, that's why you had had success. And people uh, people saw the success. It wasn't just, you know, our own, you know, drinking our own bathwater. It was actually a pretty successful time in BC. Mm-hmm. Just if I can go back just briefly to some the you know what some would call the extra parliamentary part you touched on your time at expo 86 when jimmy pattison took that over subsequently gordon campbell's you know deeply associated with the 2010 olympic games we're now at the 40th anniversary of just about the 40th anniversary of expo 86 what's your assessment of them in retrospect how critical were they to the overall uh, direction of the province both politically and economically and is it time for someone to think of doing this again um, I'm a little biased, Jeff. I'm a huge fan of those two events that you mentioned. And, you know, I when I was working in Victoria, um, Expo was then Transpo. It was just getting, you recall, it was just becoming mm-hmm. um, an entity. And um, and I so badly wanted to be involved in that. The, the theme was a man in motion. It was about transportation, uh, things that interested me a lot. And um, so when when um, I had the opportunity to actually go to work uh, at Expo, that was a that was a big deal for me. And we, you know, it was um, uh, uh, one of my jobs was trying to introduce the importance of Expo to the rest of the province. You know, you, you could you could understand Vancouver, but um, how does it play in in my hometown of Cornell? <laughs> um, and um, so uh, I. I thought that this was going to be one of the most important uh, um, foundations for the future of, of BC that, um, uh, uh, you know, we, we went on the road. We were, we talked an awful lot to British Columbians around the province and they bought into it and uh, in a big way, as we all know, and then it was uh, wildly successful uh, and double the, uh, the attendance that, um, you know, it was like we had two sets of books. We had uh, Jimmy's uh, set of books that was very conservative, and then we had the uh, the Expo team's uh, set of books that were pretty aggressive. And and uh, fortunately, they melded together, and we had a wildly successful event that I I would say is one of the most important things in BC history, as far as putting BC on the map, um, creating an opportunity for investment in British Columbia. Uh, there was an awful lot of business attention paid to bc that had never been there before as we know so you know it was very important the olympics i worked on the olympics for 12 years as a volunteer um, and was on furlong's uh, ambassador committee uh, did all those things and saw again how um, it influences the the perception of of british columbia and canada around the world i think that that we can point to many very successful events, global events, where British Columbians have played major roles in their organization because we developed that that um, uh, talent pool right here in BC because of Expo and then again 2010. So, you know, we we have that we have that talent pool. Uh, we know that they they come with their big benefits. Cost is a huge thing to be concerned about nowadays, of course, and that has to be taken into uh, to measure, to consideration. But um, yes, I would say that uh, um, every once in a while, if we can prove to ourselves as British Columbians that we're worthy and we can do these things extremely well, why wouldn't they if they work for the external audience as well? What would you rather do an ex- uh, next, an expo or Olympics? What do you think is more important? Or would be better for BC. 
Ah, uh, wow. That's a, that's a tough question that I haven't said before, Mike. I'm going to make a snap decision. I'm going to say Expo. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm going to say is that the Olympics have gone have gotten so expensive um, that um, uh, we we have, and if John Furlong were sitting here, be whispering in my ear, tell them about, tell them this, tell them that, and tell them that that we have the best model for the Olympics of any other jurisdiction on the globe, because we we did it in such a fashion that it was cost effective um, and. Um, uh, you know, it was relatively small and tight. And um, uh, if we had the opportunity to do it again, we could even do it better. Um, and, you know, I would argue that um, uh, we could do an Olympics um, very well, uh, set a new tone, a new new model, if you will, for the Olympics, uh, Winter Olympics on a global basis. But the, um, the Expo... Um, uh, that provides you with the opportunity to, to market your province entirely, market um, uh, the products that you produce, the talents that you have, I think more so than the, than the Olympics. I always used to say to people, you, you know, um, a six-month uh, exposition provides you with a lot more opportunities than a 17-day sporting event. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, I agree. I love both. Don't get me wrong. Let, well, let's let's talk about Expo Twenty Four, Expo Twenty Twenty Four, which is coming to British Columbia next year uh, in October, when <laughs> uh, political parties are setting up their pavilions and inviting voters to come and visit. And uh, BC United, uh, no one seems to know where to find that uh, pavilion right now, or at least uh, not enough. Um, how do you think? Uh, what do you think Kevin Falcon needs to do to rebuild support around uh, his his brand, his party, uh, with uh, ten months to the rip period right now? Uh, tall order. What's uh, you've seen? You've sat in a lot of back rooms over the years. Uh, what's what's your quick advice? Well, I'm I'm not sitting in the back room of this one uh, so far, Mike. Mm -hmm. Just so you know, so you can't blame anything on me this time. <laughs> uh, so. Um, uh, I would say that it's tough. It's tough. I don't think there's any doubt about that. When you have um, um, the uh, the center right split the, the way that it is right now, nobody knows what the Conservative Party is. I would argue that. I mean, I don't even know the guy that walked over to join Rustad. I don't even know him. Uh, I've been around a bit. Uh, I know Rustad going back a um, uh, hundred years and his uh, family before that. Um, out of Prince George, but um, um, uh, the fact that the um, the center right is split is very tough, as we all know. And David Eby uh, comes off of a very successful regime of um, of um, I'll say Jeff May's regime. Um, Mike, yeah, uh, Jeff um, and John Horgan had a very successful time. And through through some very good work, and the fact that um, John Horgan was a a very special, in my view, uh, leader at the time, and uh, and uh, so that has given EB a very big uh, uh, foot up, and we'll see how well he handles that going forward. But so far, he's uh, he's done pretty well, and uh, um, and the uh, opposition is split, uh, so. I think that Kevin and company have to have to do some of the things they're doing. I mean, they're 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 bringing out more policy than any one of us might have recommended at a different time. Uh, you know, so far ahead of the writ, and they're they're already talking some some of their policy initiatives, which um, the three of us might have said ten years ago. No, you just don't do that. Not it's too early. You're giving too much ammunition to the to the government uh, to be able to attack you. Well, I think that they have to do that. I think they have to be big and bold. So, you know, it's, it's. Um, I think Jeff uh, criticized me for being old school about SOS um, last week or something. So I'm going to be old school again and say, you know, um, there's only so many things you can do. They've got to bring down EB's positives and they've got to bring up their own a recognition and then their their own positive. So 
bringing down EB and company, uh, their numbers, that's got to be one side of the uh, the coin. And how negative a campaign do you run in that respect? That's an important consideration. And then on, on developing their own story, um, they have to have their own policy set. How much do you bring forward that um, that um, uh, those policies prior to the RIP period? I think you have to have some big, bold ideas that you can <clears throat> get the governing party to disagree with. And you can start mm-hmm. building that uh, that differentiation that's so important. And... Um, um, and uh, I would say you got to get rid of the conservatives as well. And uh, I'm not, you know, I don't know how you do that yet, but uh, yeah, I don't know if um, uh, Campbell or, or I should say Kevin would have uh, the conservatives back in the uh, the liberal fold. But um, um, you know, that's that's one way of doing it. The other way is just to uh, to um, well take their platform out from under them. Well, just uh, on the current work you're doing Jess which and the problem you're pointing to with SOS is very much crime disorder the addiction crisis um, and I, I did use the term old school because it's a familiar yeah. uh, strategy for people on in the, you know who are particularly directly impacted and have resources also to raise their voice so the business community people and so on to challenge government on a nonpartisan basis on this which is what you're doing but what is new and definitely not old school about your approach is your uh, going to establish key performance indicators on this very broad social issue, and your your call to action is basically just fix it. Yeah. Um, can you talk a bit about what those indicators might be, and whether that your your team has a sense of what a fix might look like? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, Jeff, the the most difficult thing is trying to decide what success looks like, and as you know, and in so many things and not only public life, but business, trying to establish what success looks like is really important. Um, You know, it's not like we're a bunch of visionaries that have that nailed down. But I I do know that um, uh, just doing the same things over and over again and expecting a different result, uh, we know what that's all about. So it's just, it's, um, uh, it was, this is this is a passion um, project for me, and it is for a whole lot of other people as well. We just feel that, oh my God, we've done so much, we've tried so much, nothing seems to be um, uh, fixing the problem. Uh, we have to take a different approach. And so, uh, <clears throat> the way SOS came about is just evolved in some people talking about about how bad it was and how tired people were of not seeing the improvements. And yet um, we can all point to uh, actions taken by uh, our current government, previous governments, that we'd all think, hey, that makes sense. We got we to gotta do that. I refer to it as sort of the whack-a-mole approach in that we, we get so focused on individual aspects of the larger problem, whether it be decriminalization, whether it be mental health, whether it be... Um, um, safe supply, homelessness, all those things are really important. And and some of the work that's been done on on those things individually, um, uh, some of them have helped, but they haven't fixed the problem and they haven't fixed the overall problem. So we said, okay, let's let's bring together British Columbians, not just business, but um, uh, concerned citizen groups from around the province, small business, medium-sized business, big business. They're the easier ones to organize because they have associations and and um, and resources. Let's bring them together and say to government, look, it's time that this was fixed. What we're going to do is help ramp up the awareness of not only the issues, but the cost of those issues to British Columbians, to whether it be, be families' cost of living, whether it be lost jobs because stores are shutting down uh, uh, problems and, and certainly that's occurring. And at the end of the day, say to, say to government, we're willing to work with you, but we actually are going to base this not on what you announce, but the results that you get. And so coming up with those KPIs is critical. And so 
there are there are crime stats galore everywhere you look there are crime stats the difficult ones to find jeff to your question uh, are provincial crime stats that are that are reported out on a on a regular enough basis to actually use to measure um, uh, success, especially in the short term. Um, if you if you go on the Solicitor General's website, you'll find that they have uh, stats <clears throat> aggregated there. Um, and here we are on the basically the last month of 2023, and the most recent stats on that website are 2021 not six months ago or three months ago, two years ago. So, you know, that's just, that, that's part of the problem, I think, that we can't measure that um, that success. So um, what, we're, what we have to do is we have to find a number of stats, and maybe it's only four or five key stats on crime and violence, and we would like that on a province basis rather than, than individual communities. And then we might have to go the, uh, uh, I think we will have, have to go the route of some, some uh, surveys where we, we have two sources. We have public opinion, which we can measure whenever we want. And so if you, if you were going and test people's views on how they feel about uh, safety, crime, in their own communities, that's one, and their own their own safety for their themselves and their families. That's one measurement. That if you measured that on a quarterly basis, that would provide you um, one stat. You then also do the business surveys about how they feel about uh, the extent of the crime that they're experiencing in their businesses, and do that on a regular basis as well. So you have those hardcore stats that are whether it be BC statistics or or Stats Canada, uh, and then you have um, um, the uh, the surveys as well. So um, you'll have to look for those announcements um, when we're ready to make them. But um, yeah, well, we'll uh, we'll we'll be tracking it. We'll be keeping an eye on it here at the I Hotel don't... Pacifico. Um, in, in our final minute here, Jess, um, I just wanted to make mention of uh, another fight, and that's the fight you've had with cancer. And uh, typical of the guy you are, you've you've leveraged that to help other people, and uh, you've raised a ton of money. Um, do you want to put in a plug for what what you're doing there? Um, yeah, I'd love to. I want to yeah. be ambassador to Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very pleased for John Horgan, actually, uh, Jeff. And if you're talking to him, please pass that on nice for me. Well. I'm very pleased for him. Uh, I know the battle that he's had. I don't know exactly the treatment that he had, but I think a lot, we had a lot of similarities and uh, I know how tough that can be. And um, to have him um, get that appointment pleased me very, very much. So um, yeah, I had uh, squamous cell carcinoma stage four because it was during COVID. Uh, we couldn't get to see a doctor, couldn't get uh, uh, assessed um, quickly enough. And it developed into stage four, so that's that's uh, pretty scary. And so, thirty-five radiation treatments, some surgeries, yes. some seven chemo treatments. Um, and uh, as of last week, um, I am uh, cancer-free uh, awesome. still. So, um, in February, February the fourth will be my third year anniversary of my last uh, chemo and radiation uh, treatment. So. That's all good. I still have some some remaining after effects. My my voice is um, um, not what it used to be. Um, it's got a different tone, <laughs> and uh, my uh, my energy is not quite back to where where it was. But we're working on that hard. My hemoglobin levels took a real dive, took a real beating, and um, building that up has been a bit of a struggle. And that's what provides you with your energy. So. Um, uh, I had been on the board of the BC Cancer Foundation for five years prior to being diagnosed. I was chair for three years, and this was all because of the good work that I had seen the cancer agency do in the past for friends and family. Not me, because I was invincible. And then I determined that I wasn't invincible, and I went through it myself. I keep telling people I do my due diligence backwards, and uh, I determined for myself that we have a very, very, we have a great 
um, cancer agency in British Columbia. It has its ups and downs, it has its critics, but um, I can't be one of them because um, I have been served so well by them. So while I was under treatment, I, um, I asked about uh, research. Um, my um, uh, oncologist who I had known previously, they told me that there was some research that should be done on head and neck cancers. And I said, well, what's stopping us from doing it? And they said, well, money. And I said, well, yeah, <laughs> we can do that. Let's, let's, um, let's raise some money. And um, uh, so I shot my mouth off and, um, and um, um, they said, well, fine, we appreciate it. You tell us when you have it. And uh, so we, we went to work, my wife and I, and, uh, and we uh, coerced uh, lots of friends and, and uh, others into uh, contributing. We've, raised a million and a half dollars that's great and uh, mm -hmm. the research is uh, underway it started is it a specific it, fund jess that you're raising it to or is it just the bc cancer foundation bc cancer foundation okay uh, yeah it goes through the bc cancer foundation which of course goes directly to the agency and right. so the the research is called path uh, which is a crazy acronym because it stands for personalized approaches to head and neck cancers Makes sense out of that. Um, but um, uh, what they're doing is taking advantage of the fact that we have the um, Michael Smith Genome, Genomic Center here in BC and can sequence the, um, the cancer genome of uh, patients. So <clears throat> they're recruiting patients who have just been diagnosed um, and having their cancer tumors sequenced so they can help determine why these people uh, get cancer, this cancer, while others don't. The other thing about the, <clears throat> the cancer that, that I have, and um, I suspect uh, John Horgan as well, uh, there's a fairly high occurrence of, um, of reoccurrence. And um, so they're trying to figure out why that is. And so they, they sequence somebody's um, cancer tumor when they're first diagnosed, and then if it comes back, they're able to sequence it again. And through that process, um, maybe identify why that happens. And if once you identify why, you can you can identify how to stop it. Oh, that's and, important uh, work. That's what we're doing. That's great. Well, Jess, uh, I'd like to thank you for stopping by the Hotel Pacifico. Uh, there's lots more to unpack. We'll hope to have you on again uh, at some future date. Um, it's uh, twenty five dollars uh, for valet in your car today, so uh, <laughs> we can give you a five dollar off voucher for that. Um, hey, Vancouver, that's cheap, man. <laughs> but thanks a lot, and we uh, we hope to see Many you. Thanks, soon. Jess. Great to see you. Great to see you guys as well, and good luck with the uh, Hotel Pacifico. I I really do enjoy it. Hello, guests. Last week we spoke about the importance of action and reconciliation and how presenting sponsor TELUS is staying true to that through their Indigenous Reconciliation Action Plan. This week, we're going to talk about accountability. Because on November 23rd, TELUS will be releasing the fifth edition of their annual Indigenous Reconciliation and Connectivity Report. The report will provide a progress update on how TELUS is measuring up to the 18 meaningful commitments the organization has made to advance connectivity, enable positive social outcomes, increase cultural responsiveness, and support economic reconciliation. And listeners, I'll give you a little preview. TELUS has connected 248 Indigenous lands to their world-leading pure fiber network with over 89,000 people living in Indigenous communities having access to their advanced broadband networks. And I'll give you another reason to check out this report. It features artwork from Indigenous artists including Johnny Kettler III of the Nadle Wootan Yenka Dene people. If you live in around Prince George, you may have seen his artwork on TELUS's fleet of vehicles in that region. The images are striking. Ketlo brings elements of surrealism to images from the Dene culture, to the fleet branding, and into the report. In two days, you will be able to see more of his art interspersed among 28 inspiring stories of Indigenous-led solutions in this year's report at telus.com backslash reconciliation. Hello, you've reached the Hotel Pacifico Strategy Suite. Well, look who's here. It's Kate Hammer. Thank heaven. Kate, uh, so you couldn't find your way back through the maze, but how how did you make it back to the Hotel Pacific? Well, I feel so, someone help you? Did Jess catch him, uh, steer you in on his way out of the of the hotel? Got a long lesson in why you can never leave. Yes, the metaphor that's right. actually works. 
You can I'm... never leave. <laughs> you tried I'm... to escape. <laughs> I failed it. Failed attempt. And I'm back here. But I'm glad to be back here because I've actually been keen to ask Jeff about the baby announcement. I mean, sorry. Oh, sorry. The BC NDP convention over the weekend. Uh, how was yeah. it, Jeff? Yeah. Well, it was very smooth from a, you know, back rumors point of view. It couldn't have been better. There was no untoward events at all. You're referring to uh, what turned out to be a bit of a high risk uh, proposition by the premier having his uh, partner, Kaylee Lynch, introduce him. And uh, she did a very uh, warm job at a drop the bombshell early on that they're expecting their third child next uh, early next summer, which was um, great news. Uh, but he joked later that many people came up to him when he'd finished his speech during the afternoon to say how what a great speech uh, it had been, how um, how how much they enjoyed it, uh, that it was something they would never forget, and that his comments were good too. Okay, so how uh, how old is Eby right now? How old is he? Forty six. Oh man, that's a snap question. <laughs> Early forties. Okay, oh, nice. he's, he's yeah. older than that. Yeah, okay, I'm talking, yeah maybe you're talking to a guy who had a kid at uh, forty four. Okay, so okay. like, so he's a little bit older than that when he's going to have the next kid. So like, energy level is going to be uh, it's going to be channeled for the premier. Yeah, well, heading into an election. I was going to I was going to yeah. ask you Mike if there's like a rose deer blog about all the premiers who've had a baby while they're in office and then I decided that's a nothing burger question because it probably was like pretty commonplace through like the 1980s if you include men um actually I don't think any women have done it at all I'm not I'm as also, premier no not as premier yeah <laughs> next anyway, was, uh, we digress very, very good <laughs> very successful convention uh the boxes that uh you know, campaigners like to tick is how's the how's the money? It's fabulous. Yeah. Uh, the financial report showed that the NDP is fully funded and could start anytime. Not that there's anybody talking about starting anytime in the election. There was no conversations about anything early, which has been kind of a perennial uh, uh, discussion point for some people during the fall, whether that would happen. Uh, Evie's speech was much more on the contrast side, very much shaping up his arguments against Kevin Falcon in the mm -hmm. uh, coming months and campaign. Uh, painting him with his own history from uh, the many years he spent in government. That and, uh, him on. and the guy who won't have your back or the guy who. Yeah. yeah. And uh, trying to draw out those contrasts. So very little time spent on the conservatives, which is logical and zero time spent on the greens. So just very much uh, drawing that contrast. Um, so the mood was very good. There was almost 800 delegates there. Uh, it's quite expensive to go to an NDP convention. So mm. uh, you pay your own, Generally speaking, the uh, delegates pay their own registration, and it was in Victoria, so it was traveled, but there was a good turnout, just about 800. And the um, no issues on the environmental front, which uh -huh. is normally a divisive point, small demonstration on fracking. The fracking, but, yeah. But the issue, of course, of uh, Israel and Gaza and the uh, Hamas terror attacks and how that would be reflected in the resolution was uh, one that uh, I know they spent a ton of time on. And what uh, came out uh, on uh, Sunday, just about the last piece of business was an emergency resolution, which uh, was very careful to acknowledge um, the the terrorist violence imposed by Hamas, the consequences for children uh, and women and others, of course, many, many in Israel, but also talked about the consequences for civilians in, in Gaza and then uh, did call for a ceasefire, but also um, uh, pushed for uh, willingness on Ottawa's part to accept refugees, to send humanitarian aid and so on. So there was a lot of uh, backroom work done on that front to minimize yeah. uh, offense on either side. And I think they largely succeeded. That was a, so the, a the pass, discipline. Pass near the discipline unanimous. Of, yeah. Well, the discipline of power is uh, helping smooth over uh, disagreements, I guess, within the NDP family. seems like everyone's happy. It sounds like uh, yeah. the beginning of the end. Well, speaking of the peak, uh, you know, like, yeah. gonna, is this the peak? Uh, you know, is it going to be harder from here on? I mean, it sounds like a very well managed. Mm -hmm. uh, well, know, it was a great. It was a great job. It looked good, and the premier felt uh, looked strong, and he was he was relaxed. But I'll leave you to make the case, Mike, about why all of those things don't matter, and the campaign will matter, and those numbers will change. And yeah. I think those would all be valid points. I wouldn't argue with you. I think there's. There is a, a lot of uh, runway left for problems to arise for any government, particularly when the issues are so intractable and um, and difficult to manage. So we'll see how it goes. Well, there was yeah. one there was one comment I really wanted to run by you, Jeff, which was, you know, Premier 
EB reflecting on the record of his government since 2017, saying he's nowhere near satisfied. I just, you know, was there a pearl clutch moment for you? Was that hard not to take personally? Like how, how did no, that? He, he listed all the work that uh, Horgan's uh, team had accomplished, but he's pointing to, I think, the obvious fact that there's a long way to go before the changes in housing that have been so intense this fall are going to are going to really bear fruit. Uh, he spoke briefly about the opioid crisis, and and you know we've all we've talked about this before on the pod about how intractable these issues are. Mm -hmm. So I think um, you know he also wants to keep people revved up, and what he ran on as leader was he'll get things done, and if he uh, faces a risk down the road, it's that um, you know he'll he'll struggle he'll struggle as governments often do with execution and finding the bandwidth and the energy in the public service to actually land some of these things in a uh, consistent and steady way. You know, child care is one example. We're now at year six of the 10 year plan and there's like light years more child care available at an affordable rate in the province than there was in uh, 2017. But uh, there's an awful lot of people out there who have not seen it yet and don't think it's uh, coming fast enough, including some of the advocates who demanded these changes in the first place. So it's, it's a long haul uh, proposition and, He's very impatient. I mean, well, from, a Go ahead. from a political manager's uh, perspective, obviously, it sounds like the convention was a success mm -hmm. in terms of not creating any headaches for the government um, and, uh, you know, not um, worsening any divisions that might exist in any political party has divisions. And it sounds like everyone left is a happy family. I guess uh, the only uh, thing on my mind would be just the psychology of the delegates as they leave the convention. Uh, I can recall a convention the PC Liberals had in 2016, which was by all measures a successful convention, but maybe people left a little too complacent. Maybe people left thinking, hey, things are good with, with the good ship BC Liberal. Uh, and, um, you know, the hunger level may not have been there to the extent it needed to happen where in our convention in 2012, people were like desperate, fearful, hungry, wanting to work hard. So, What's your assessment of kind of where people's heads are at in the NDP as they're 10 months from the RIP period here? Well, there's quite a new team that's come in and a lot of my colleagues and peers that were with, certainly in the top, uh, you know, at the premier's office level and so on changed when David came in. He's brought in a very capable new group and they're very hungry to demonstrate their their capabilities, as is he. Right. But I think your warning is well placed and the thing that's going to come next uh, as is that the constituencies are going to select candidates, uh, obviously with some engagement with the center and um, not naming names or suggesting that there's anybody uh, in the NDP caucus who's passed it or passed their prime or whatever. But uh, um, there are a few uh, who logic would say might be thinking about retirement. And so there's two dynamics, I think, that uh, we'll be interested to see going forward, how constituency nomination races play out especially in seats where there may be more uh, veteran uh, incumbents who are now going to not run again. Uh, and then there's a number of people putting their hands up because they see the polling and they think that a seat that previously was, uh, you know, unattainable now but made look almost safe given the current numbers you see on some of the analysis. So I think uh, the party will be uh, absorbed with the candidate search and selection process. And a question I have, and I don't want to start a rumor here because I haven't heard it anywhere, but uh, you know, you and I, Mike, at this time of a cycle would be wondering if the leader wants to change the cabinet before they get to the budget. Yeah. Uh, there was no sign of that at all. But if there was going to be a further promotion of, of new talent and future talent, uh, it might happen in the next few months. It'd uh, be very interesting to see if that's what happens. Well, maybe happens. even in the next few weeks, because you yeah. want the new cabinet ministers to have a chance to read the yeah. briefing binders well, the before session, they, the session ends uh, next week. And yeah. next week is the last week. So yeah, that would uh, yeah. that was, be uh, the right uh, time. Again, I emphasize no one's whispered that in my ear, but uh, I just look at the cycle and go, okay, that's a question that should be asked. Why? Well, I, I just heard a rumor that there might be a cabinet shuffle in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> not that's what I heard it from. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not. But, but I think I think the renewal piece is important too, and, and yes, there are uh, still quite a few MLAs who were elected in two thousand five. Uh, well, and, not many, but nine for sure. Yeah, yeah, and and I know from the BC Liberal experience that the need a party's need for renewal is greater than the natural replacement Appetite. that takes place mm -hmm. in caucus. People tend to like doing the job, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes leadership's got to be probably pushier than they would like to be to move people along. Um, but that's just the, 
the natural evolution of parties and the parties that don't renew fast enough, we know what happens to them. Yeah, well, there was a significant amount of renewal achieved at the last cabinet shuffle, yeah. but yeah, there, uh, was, there were a number yeah. of people who are uh, would be in their mid to late seventies at the end of the next term if they were successful again. Mm -hmm. And so it's fair to ask for up and coming talent. Uh, why don't uh, yeah. why don't I get a chance? Is oh, it? I well, mean, it's it's young for a U.S. president. I'm just saying. Oh yeah, but I'm talking about uh, other folks. I know. Fair, well, fair. Yeah. Sorry. They may, uh, fair. They, the NDP may have some. They may have some old MLAs, but they're not Ralph Sultan old. So. <laughs> no, but I don't, and I don't think it's just our our problem. I see uh, the BC Liberals uh, announcing aggressively announcing that everybody's running again, and yeah. you know I think that's a tension for uh, Kevin Falcon to manage between his need, which I believe is objective, to renew. Uh, yeah. And uh, his need also to keep strong incumbents in place to fend off possible conservative threats and that kind of thing. Yeah. All right. Uh, we do just want to I want to take a couple minutes to reflect on one big announcement last week, um, which was the announcement of the the lithium ion battery uh, plant in Maple Ridge. It was a joint announcement with I think a two hundred and five million ish commitment from the federal government, eighty million dollars from the province. Um, is this corporate welfare money? Well, it, it's it's corporate subsidies, and it's interesting that governments today and center left governments today are embracing uh, taxpayer money going in to finance uh, basically private businesses. Is the public embracing that to the same extent? Well, it's cloaked in climate change and, and um, greening the economy, and certainly in Ontario, there's massive investments. Twenty eight uh, billion. And Stellantis. if the federal government's putting money in Ontario, then by God, BC should get its fair <laughs> share, you know, and on and on here, and here. on it goes. Here, yeah, here. Yeah. But we went through the cycle before where going back to the 70s and 80s, there was a lot of money shoveled into um, big corporate subsidies. And, it, and then Preston Manning came along and other leaders came along and said, and all corporate welfare, right, for these corporate welfare bums and all sorts of things like that. And Gordon Campbell got elected in 2001 and said, no more corporate subsidies. And that was coming um, off the NDP's um, failed bailout of Skina Cellulose, which cost hundreds of millions of dollars. So now the pendulum swinging again. And these so that's are an amazing historical reference. I'm going to have to go back into my vault and get okay. some for you. <laughs> you were there, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it's it's where it's what is a good investment? What is a bad investment? And unfortunately, government does not have a great track record in picking winners and losers. And or hopefully they're just picking winners, but sometimes they end up being losers and it's taxpayers money at stake. So is this where we want to, you know, invest our taxpayers money? Now, today there's a story in the Globe or national news about a similar investment in Windsor. And it turns out that a lot of the workers that are going to be working in this plant are going to be here on temporary visas yeah. from South Korea. Yeah. And I don't yeah. think anyone was expecting that. So I don't know. I have no idea about Maple Ridge. Uh, my well, there would be my believe hometown, it or not, by the way. I I should have known this. There was a little battery plant there already. Yeah. And yes. it's gonna it's gonna get huge. Yeah. yeah. I think there's a bit of a different context now, which is that again, it goes back to climate policy, is that mm -hmm. Biden Biden didn't do mm -hmm. carbon pricing. He just went huge on these investments. investments. And Canada's been struggling to try to come even close yeah. to uh competing on that on that terrain. But I think it's great news. Uh and and it's something that the um that uh, David Eby and his team, I'm sure, will talk about a lot because it provides that uh, ray of hope on the climate front that's so important to the larger discussion. Well, just for anyone who's counting, and in the course of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation is, um, you know, if you look at the sort of the the 205 mil from the feds, the 80 mil from the province, 450 jobs total. It's 100 now plus another 350. It's a little over 600,000. It's like 630 thousand dollars per job, and I think. That's a big number. I wanted to ask you, Jeff, like how much does this calculus, how much does the math change when you add in the climate, um, clean energy transition element to it? Well, I think it's it, increasingly those discussions have always had a much higher per job cost, which is a very crude yes. kind of measure of it because there's all kinds of ripple effects through the whole economy on these things. I mean, BC has already had a pretty good track record with clean tech, especially around some of the electrical stuff. So the Corvus battery plant and so on historically, uh, which was used for ships has been used to power ferries in Scandinavia. These, these are things which tragically uh, get to a certain stage and then get purchased by uh, foreign owners with big, big, deep pockets. 
So uh, if we're going to play a role in this future economy and have jobs arise from it, I think some of this stuff is going to have to happen. Uh, and, and, and Quebec is excellent at it. One of the other things that's happening right now is Quebec is spending north of $130 billion, I think, to electrify their economy huh. using pension funds and things like that. So a lot of these uh, discussions need to happen. Like we have a very, very successful, uh, you know, arm's length managed pension fund, but it would be great if those trustees decided to be more upfront about investing back in the BC economy so that our pension dollars could uh, help our economy transform. Uh, we don't have a lot of time to uh, to fret about some of these policies. We just need the investment so we can make the change. That's, I think, how a lot of voters are going to feel. All right, let's take this discussion to the mini bar. Let's raise a glass or take a shot. Time to raid the mini bar. I got a shot this week. It's for uh, it's against uh, Pierre Polyev, who who normally has a quick answer and a nasty one uh, sometimes or most times uh, on anything. But when asked whether he would support the anti scab legislation finally brought in by the uh, federal liberals, said he would have to study the matters if it was a new concept. We've had this legislation for several decades in BC, and our economy has been leading the way. And if he's serious about getting votes from working people, which he says he is, he can't just remain mum on whether or not it's okay for an employer who's in free collective bargaining with his employees to hope simply change to a, a different group of employees in the event of a strike. So shot to Pierre Polyev. He's being challenged by Unifor to uh, say where he stands. And I think he, he has to uh, join those other parties, all of them in the House. They're going to vote for this or he's going to be a hypocrite. I'll go next. It's a twofer for me today. Mm. First of all, I'd like to raise a glass to our air quotes colleague from Curse of Politics, Corey Tonight. And on this week's show, Corey made the point, which I agree with, that one of the messages that's missing from the housing debate is that for a lot of, especially younger Canadians, there's still the dream of home, owner, of home ownership. And what's heard from levels of government a lot is just increase rental or increase other non-market forms. But where is the hope for young Canadians who want a mortgage and want to own their place so they can build capital and, and uh, invest in the home of their dreams? So I think that was an important point by Corey, and uh, I want to raise a glass to him on that. Secondly, I want to take a shot. And I want to take a shot at Airbnb. And my shot relates to not fully appreciating the government risk you were uh, accumulating as your as your model was uh, accumulating wealth for you over the years. And they obviously failed to, at least in Canada here, um, account for the fact that they could have a fairly, will it be dest ultimately destructive? I'm not sure, hmm. but a big impact on their, their revenue and, and their value of their asset here. And I think that comes down to the political assessment of what's going on in Canada and what the externalities of their uh, instrument uh, was having on the housing market. So, wow. and I wouldn't even put that on the, like the GR advisors or whoever's advising them in Canada. I think it's the nature of their model that ultimately proved to be politically unsustainable here. Um, so that's my shot this week. Wow. That's an interesting one. Uh, so I'm going to take a shot too. I'm going to take a shot um, at uh uh, Vancouver City Councillor Colleen Hardwick, who this week, um, former Councillor Hardwick, former Councillor Hardwick, sorry, and yeah. I'm an, who this week um, shared a, a, a link on Twitter to a City Hall Watch article that had a sort of the cumulative effect of all the provincial legislation around zoning and densification, with like this pullout of Dunbar and all the um, all the the. Uh, the new heights for the new for the new building and densification that can happen there. And she did it with a, a, a quote, a sort of call to people to speak out and a quote from a T.S. Eliot poem um, saying, um, <laughs> saying uh, uh, the this, you know, something like it's like this is this is the end of the world and it comes with not a bang, uh, but a whimper. 
Uh, and I am all for literary references. Um, I appreciate there's a lot of room for interpretation, interpretation in poetry. I love that about poetry. But like the poem she's referencing by T.S. Eliot, The Hollow Men, is about people who are kind of stuck in a state of stasis, stasis and inertia. And I just don't think it was the right literary uh, reference for landing a point um, about people rallying against um, or rallying to maintain the character of a neighborhood or access to parking. Well, you have to educate us on literary references going forward, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> they're welcome. Just make sure they're fitting. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank our presenting sponsor, Talis, for making this episode possible. And thanks to our guest, Jess Ketchum, for checking in. And thank you, listeners, for making Hotel Pacifico part of your weekly routine. Check in next week for your re- at your regular time and place. BC, you can never leave. Check out time at Hotel Pacifico. We hope you enjoyed your stay.